that. And thank you so much, because yeah, that's there's a lot of people, especially in Europe right now, where the time zone is really, really wrong, that really wanted yeah. to come, but they're like, it's like three in the morning and I'm not going to be able to make it. So then we can pass it on to those ones where the time zones don't work very well. So, but I'll pass it over to Sarah. All right. Thank you so much, Erin. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to host one of these um, happy hour events. Uh, so as Erin said, my name is Sarah, Sarah Hancock. Um, I'm from the University of New South Wales, Sydney, Australia. I'm also the secretary for the Australian and New Zealand Society for Mass Spectrometry, and uh, most recently the co-chair of the FEMS Awards Committee, along with Tusi. So today we have with us our guest, uh, Professor Margaret Shield, Vice Chancellor of QUT, um, Queensland, Australia. And so because we're having a bit of an Aussie takeover of the FEMS happy hour today, I wanted to start today's meeting uh, the way we would start a meeting in Australia. So and that is with um, the acknowledgement of country. <clears throat> so if you visited Australia in, in pre-COVID times, uh, you would be familiar with this and how we start our meetings. You might also be familiar with welcome to country. Um, but I'm just going to drop a link in the chat if you don't know what it is, um, so you can read up and, and learn a little bit more about what, what it is and why we do it. So I'd like to start today's meeting by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet. And today I'm calling in from Darawal country, which is located uh, to the southern part of um, present day Sydney. I pay my respects to their elders past and present and to Aboriginal elders emerging. And I would also like to extend a special welcome to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islanders who may be joining our call today. So I can see we also have a number of Australians on the call today, and I would also like to invite you to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands in which you are located in the chat. Okay, so um, it is my great pleasure to introduce our guest today, Professor Margaret Shield, Vice Chancellor and President of Queensland University of Technology. So today, Margaret's going to be talking to us on the topic of leadership um, in which she is very well regarded in Australia. Um, I don't want to spoil her story too much because I know she's going to be talking about her, her career pathway, but just to give you a few of the cliff notes, uh, she obtained her PhD from the University of New South Wales. The thesis title was Collision Induced Decomposition of Multi-Atomic Ions. I actually downloaded it last night and had a little bit of a look at it just to, to see what Margaret had worked on early on in her career. After this, she postdoc at the University of Utah and the Australian National University in Canberra. Uh, before moving to the University of Wollongong in the 1990s. <clears throat> During her time um, at the University of Wollongong, she was promoted to Professor of Chemistry in 2000, and at the time she was the first female chemistry professor in Australia. From here, she had a meteoric rise, uh, being promoted to the Dean of Science in 2001, followed by the Pro Vice Chancellor of Research in 2002, and then Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research in 2005. In 2007, she became the CEO of the Australian Research Council. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with what that is, that is one of the two main funding bodies here in Australia. During her time there, she uh, led several initiatives, but perhaps the most pertinent to our group would be the introduction of new arrangements within the funding application system uh, to allow um, people to take into account career interruptions such as child rearing. From 2012 to 2017, she was the provost of the University of Melbourne before taking up her position um, as Vice Chancellor of QUT in 2018. So given her uh, illustrious career, she has a long list of extensive awards and achievements, many more than I can go into in such a short introduction. But I do want to highlight that in 2017, she was made an officer of the Order of Australia for her distinguished service to science and higher education as an academic and administrator, and through her significant contributions to the national research landscape and performance standards. And so we're very thrilled to have you here with us today, Vice Chancellor. We're very much looking forward to hearing about your career and your approach to leadership. And I'd ask all of our current members to join me in welcoming her. So thank you very much, Sarah, for that very kind introduction. Um, I'll. Uh, share my screen. I've got I've got some photos to accompany my, my story. Um, hang on, I need to share and then uh, do that, I think. And that is, 
If that's right. So you can now see the PowerPoint. So, yep. We can see that. Okay, great. Um, so as um, Sarah's indicated, uh, we, we start all our meetings here in Australia with the acknowledgement of country and, and in, uh, in my case, um, uh, the lands where QT stands belong, uh, the traditional owners were the Turbal and the Agora people, and um, we pay our respects to, to their elders past and present. And um, uh, you would see in, in, in the branding in this um, slide, which is a QUT brand in kind of image really, that we have a, um, we have, we always overlay um, our, a, a many of our images with our um, symbols and, and representation of the, our Indigenous uh, traditional owners. So it's a great pleasure to be here. I, I, and to thank you, Sarah um, and Erin uh, for organising this. And I've been asked to talk about my career, so I thought I'd run through that in a bit of history and talk about some of the things that I've navigated and some of the approaches to that, um, which were in some cases quite deliberate and in other cases, um, uh, you know, I had opportunities that presented themselves and I took, took them at the time. So the, um, I, I, when I was reflecting on, um, on some of my earlier slides on, on mass spectrometry, I quite often, and also talking about uh, research environments, I quite often talk, start with this slide, which is a photo of the cohort who were in the Cavendish Laboratory at Cambridge in, in, in the uh, late, early late 1900s, uh, late 1800s, uh, early 1900s, and, and JJ Thompson, who was in some ways the founder of um, mass spectrometry together with Aston, was in, Ca in Cavendish at the time in this illustrious photo here with all these men. And I think there's a couple of women in there um, and other people such as Rutherford and, and Niels Bohr. That was a very um, rich researching environment. And um, I love this quote in part also because Thompson talks about the importance of having different uh, people with different back backgrounds or in that, in that case, men with widely different backgrounds. And Cambridge was unique. It was a very welcoming, uh, it welcomed international students and, and visitors in a way that many other places around the world did not. So if you fast forward to the 60s, people such as Suzanne Corey, who was the first female president of the Academy of Science in Australia, or Dame, and Dame Bridget Ogilvy, who was the, uh, um, led the Wellcome Trust for a number of years, both um, did their PhDs in Cambridge in the 60s. And then I was referring to my friend Carol Robertson, and I'll mention her a few times through the talk, Carol became the first female professor of physical sciences in Cambridge in 2001. So that's a bit of a, um, you know, that was the journey that, that Cambridge was on and, and many other uh, places around the world. So, so at the time that I started my career, I started with a very firm view that everything was about the pipeline. And, and eventually, if there's enough women coming into the system, there'll be enough women at the other end. I've changed that view over the years, and I'll, I'll explain a bit about that as I go through. So as Sarah indicated in my 20s, I started as, this was a pretty traditional way of studying in Australia with not a lot of mobility and still not in Australian uh, universities. So apart from the odd person who went overseas, such as Suzanne or Bridget, um, generally uh, uh, Australian academics would do, Australian students did their bachelor's and PhDs in the same institution and then went overseas and then maybe returned to somewhere like ANU, which used to offer postdocs, but now, now more generally um, in other places. So in my 20s, I did that. I did my PhD on this rather large uh, machine, uh, which we used to refer to as Triple M, which Peter Derrick built at La Trobe University and then moved to the University of New South Wales. And it had a, a one sector, a one metre radius electric sector and a seven tonne magnet. And the idea of building a big machine was that if you wanted to look at big molecules, you needed a big mass spectrometer. And, uh, but even despite the fact that this actually had a mass range of 16,000, the best I could do in, my, in that PhD, because uh, I was looking at peptides, was a peptide of around 1,800. And that was using an ionization technique you'll never have heard of called field desorption, which was a generated a lot of patients, I can tell you, because <laughs> you used to have to put, grow these fine emitters and get, put them inside and they break a lot of the time. So at the time, we thought the challenge was in transmitting and detecting large ions, but really, as it turned out, was all about 
how you could ionize um, molecules. So I moved from, and you can see that this was uh, this was built in house at, at the University of New South Wales, modified at, uh, at the Trove and modified at UNSW, and then we had our own data system. And you know, if something wasn't working, you'd have to learn how to program machine code to go in and fix the instrument. So um, it, I learned a lot of good, useful, practical skills along the way. Then I went to Utah, um, where I worked on this machine, which was a forward sector hybrid instrument. Um, and partly we went to Utah because I ran into Jim McCluskey, who was, I worked for at a conference in New Zealand. And I'll come back to some of the benefits of being a big fish in a small sea. And, and he said to me, I was doing physical, my PhD was really physical chemistry, but he said, come to work with me and learn about biology um, because that's where mass spectrometry is going. And that was really a good um, prompt. And also at that time, we weren't sure I was married, my husband, whether we'd be able to work. And so we thought at least, well, he thought at least if we went to Utah, he could ski and play golf, which he did a lot of actually. Um, and then I um, homesickness beckoned and uh, I returned to ANU and uh, in Canberra where they had just purchased this very large machine, which was a, a ZAB um, reverse sector, um, magnetic, again, magnetic sector machine. But in, in, on both of those, the best I could do, again, was around three or 4,000 on a really good day. I could run insulin on this machine. So we were still in all those, um, all that sort of part of my scientific career, looking at the challenge of ionizing big molecules. And while I was, just as I was leaving America and, um, coming to ANU, uh, this uh, electrospray happened. And, um, and so uh, I was at ANU as a postdoc and then my parents had moved to Wollongong, south of Sydney, which is down here somewhere. And I was offered then took up a, a role as a, a young academic at the University of Wollongong. And um, as I said, just around that time, uh, electrospray had been developed, Finn had produced uh, um, uh, John Fenn had started working on polymers and then they discovered you could analyze proteins in, in the late 80s. Um, we, the first conference I went to in um, America, ASMS in 88, Fenn presented some of the early results. By 89, the whole of the conference was talking about the value of electrospray. And this just uh, took off in terms of uh, numbers of papers. So when I went to Wollongong, I said in my job interview, I wanted to get an electrospray mass spectrometer. Most people hadn't heard of it at that time because again, it was fairly new technology. The Dean told me I was crazy. I'd never get a grant for a mass spectrometer of that size in, in a little place like Wollongong, but I went ahead and I got one. And um, I got what then was the first, where well, there were several people got instruments at that time. And um, just to give you an idea of uh, some of my early uh, grant reviews, despite getting the grant to build the instrument, to buy the instrument, I couldn't get um, some funding from the Medical Research Council because people thought it was ridiculous to think that we could actually analyse proteins on a mass spectrometer, which is kind of weird now, but of course um, uh, uh, it was early days. And, and by that stage then, of course, we cracked the problem of high, high molecular weight through electrospray and, and mouldy and and so on that early instrument, my PhD students were routinely running 20 to 30,000 and, and even up to 150,000. I persisted through um, a lot of bad reviews and, and you know, people telling me I couldn't do things. I had a great boss, um, the late Leon K. McGuire, who's shown there, and he was, uh, you know, that first um, sort of piece of advice is make sure, particularly early in your career, that you have a good boss and uh, a supportive one, and he was terrific. So I then, um, you know, got a few grants, had a baby in 93, and then moved through um, the ranks of senior lecturer, uh, professor, and so on. And, you know, buying, as the department used to say, more and more mass spectrometers, including uh, a, a Q, uh, one of the early QTOFs. Um, and uh, I then uh, was joined by a, a very good uh, friend and colleague, Jennifer Beck, who, who had had Time, she was a protein chemist and she'd had seven years off. Her husband got a faculty role in the department. She came and joined my lab and learned mass spectrometry and effectively took over um, my lab. And by then we were running big um, 
we were looking at protein DNA complexes, and then of course Carol and many others around the world were looking at very large um, uh, proteins. And I highlight Jenny and, and Carol because they were both have been over my career, both great friends and great collaborators. And I was telling the group early on that um, there was no female in mass spectrometry group when I went to conferences, but Carol and I met one another at a very early stage of our careers. She just really returned to after her career break and I was sort of, you know, getting started. And uh, we used to meet up and hang out at conferences and, and um, became good friends over the years. And um, so, so, all the, the sort of networking you're doing now is really important because it's great to be able to, you know, just touch base and compare notes. And, you know, Carol and I would compare our experiences. She obviously went on to do amazing um, uh, stellar uh, things and still does. And, and Jenny and I work very closely together. And at, actually, when I took um, my first leadership role, Jenny effectively took over the, the lab and, and, and um, uh, went on from there. So, um, so that's the sort of high mass story. Uh, over that time, one of the things that was also important um, was, uh, as Sarah has indicated, she's uh, part of ANZ SMS and, and Gavin, we have Gavin Reid here as well, is the Australian and New Zealand Society for Mass Spectrometry, which started just organising conferences and then we actually formed the, the society in the early uh, 1990s, and I was helpful in that, was actually helped uh, us stay connected and actually had opportunities uh, to meet and uh, visitors to, to Australia as we hosted conferences and hosted visitors in a way that probably wouldn't have been in a regular faculty position in the US um, at, the, at that stage of my career. And so um, uh, the, uh, there's two messages I wanted to, to say about this. One is, um, is having that opportunity to have visitors. And so routinely from that, you know, you'd host conferences, there'd be three or four international plenaries, they'd be there for the week or the, uh, at the conference and we'd have opportunities to network with them. Um, and, uh, and then later on, as part of my involvement with it, and at SMS, I was the representative on the International Mass Spectrometry Committee. So then you get to go to the international meetings as a representative and um, uh, someone took this photo and said typical of me to be networking with the Nobel laureate there, Paul Kutzen is a keynote, but people like Nico Nibbering, who was the Dutch representative and so on, you, you, would, you would meet the representatives from around the world. And we'd host visitors such as, we, I was looking for a photo of Catherine Fenster, but I couldn't find it one. So the only one I, I could find, I think she must have taken and sent to me, which was me and her late husband Bob in the um, in my office in Wollongong, and Catherine's shown here. And Catherine, um, I both Carol and I experienced um, uh, was very generous at, in those early days when we were attending conferences. She used to host lunches for uh, as part of her editorship of uh, analytical chemistry. And Carol and I both benefited from being invited to those lunches and meeting people. And she always took an interest in, uh, I think, ensuring that that up and coming women were, were represented at, on in conference, um, you know, uh, in, in sessions and so on. And if you, I just took this off to her website and you see there a group with um, many women in it, as was my experience that, that the women in the group attracted other women and Carol's and, and, and I know many uh, female academics experience that, but you need people to, to reach out to, to at that time, we were relatively unknown people uh, and ensure that we um, uh, met, met, met people at conferences was really important. The other thing about ANZ SMS is it was really where I um, uh, sort of started to demonstrate or, 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 or had the opportunity to also um, pr provide leadership to a group. And, um, and what I, early on, when I first got back to Australia, uh, people said we really need to have a proper society rather than just passing all the management over from conference committee to conference committee. So I worked with a group of John McLeod and John Traeger and others and for when we you know put the constitution together and, and formed the society that's still going today, which is great. And the other thing is I noticed as I was going through my career and assessing more and more grant applications that the physicists and the other areas of chemistry had lots and lots of medals. 
And they were important for people's careers as evidence of their prestige and their, and their careers. So one of the things that I'm really pleased about is that I convinced the society to institute a series of medals for uh, uh, at different stages of careers, and we named them after John Bowie for the early career, um, the Morrison Lecture for the sort of um, mid-career, and the ANZSS medal, ANZSS SMS medal for the later career. And uh, and and you know, I, every year when they're announced, uh, I, I'm, I'm delighted to see that um, that's continued. And we were fortunate that Richard O'Hare was also involved. He, he knew a bit about metal, so he was able to get some made, and and that stood the length of time. But it, it's sort of people ask me often for career advice, and they say, well, you know, there's nothing in my department I can do to demonstrate leadership. And I then often respond with, say, well, what's what's your professional society doing, and how how can you contribute there? And so um, I found that, that and that the group of Australian and, and New Zealand mass spectrometrists are, were very supportive of, it, of each other in, in, as, as it, we progressed through our, our careers. So um, that was, um, and the literally comment was, I was a little chubby in those days. I didn't look after myself quite as well back then when I was moving uh, things uh, through. So I went on then um, around the time that I'd just not long been promoted to professor and the Dean of Science left and the head of biology convinced me crazily to put my hand up for Dean of Science. And at that time, my daughter was um, about eight or nine and my parents who were living in Wollongong who'd been tremendously supportive were not, um, not you know, they were getting older and I didn't, feel I could move and I felt like I'd done as many, almost as many things as I could have done scientifically um, at Wollongong without moving. And so I had the opportunity to uh, be the Dean of Science and then um, and then actually then the Pro Vice Chancellor, who's like the Vice President for Research Lab. So I moved fairly quickly um, to 2002 to 2005 was just a, a name change. And then uh, again, not wanting to leave Wollongong, I had the opportunity to put my hand up for the CEO of the Australian Research Council, which was just an amazing job, but it meant that I could commute uh, sort of at, at the end of the week. Anyway, it, I wasn't going too far from home. So some of those career decisions were shaped by my family and, and personal circumstances. And so, and I think that's also important as you plan your career that you, you you know, you do take those considerations into account. And, you know, had I not been in that situation, I might have done something quite different. It just the opportunity presented to have a new challenge and um, stay in, um, in Wollongong. And then, you, then the rewards that you get become less personal and about the opportunities that you provide for others. And uh, this is just one example, but uh, Bert Roberts, who's the smiling face here, was the very first appointment that I made as Dean of Science that the School of Geosciences had been trying to bring him back to Wollongong and um, hadn't been supported by the previous dean, but I took a risk on him. And then about a year later, he popped into my office and said, just so you know, I'm part of a team that's discovered a whole new species, uh, a new hominin, which became Homo florensis and was a worldwide story. And I was able to support that team to get going. And so that's just one example. But once you move into a leadership role, then it becomes about who you're supporting and, and, and their success um, rather than your own success. If, if you're a good leader, that is, which I think I'm doing okay. And um, the whole time through that period, I was focused on uh, careers, careers interruptions, um, and how people are assessed. And um, really learned in, in doing promotions and supporting people at the University of Wollongong and later in grant applications that you have to be really careful not to judge everybody by the same metrics or by the same uh, uh, standards. And so I was quite passionate about this before I went into the ARC about uh, properly taking into account career breaks. And so if I give Jenny as an example, she had a fabulous track record, Jack's papers and so on but then seven years up. So what I wanted to do in her, in her appointment, I'm saying I'm looking at what she did before and what potential they had rather than the total career. And I've done that now multiple times in appointments and promotions and grant applications. And so um, I was um, passionate going into the ARC, passionate about 
thinking how we could assess people appropriately. So the idea that merit, merit and meritocracies are, are at level, level playing field is uh, not, you know, is, is something that, that gets touted by those who, are, who actually have the advantage of that playing field. And, um, and if you looked at any, um, any data about careers of, of women in science and men in science and engineering, but also more broadly across the academy, then typically, um, any, any, no matter what data set you, you choose, you get what I would call is this sort of scissor diagram of that often there'll be more females at the start of, uh, at the early stages and uh, then men. And, and by the time you progress up the ranks, uh, that changes and the number of women drop off and the number of men in proportion increases. And at the early stage in my career, as I said, I thought, you know, it's all about the pipeline and eventually, um, eventually that will change. And that was a very strong mantra uh, at the time, even when I went to the ARC, people said, don't do anything, it's just about the pipeline. Well, it turns out 30 years later, it wasn't about the pipeline, it was about a whole range of other things, not just the pipeline. And um, some of it is family. And, you know, this fabulous quote from um, Marie Curie that uh, those of us that have had careers with uh, families it's, and particularly science can be so consuming, it's not always easy. But it's not just about that, because when I went to the ARC and we started to probe into the data, and that was really my scientific training coming in, it turns out that the success rate difference, so that's how many women apply for grants versus how many men and, and, and their success rate, actually the difference was starting at, immediately at, at post-PhD. So, so the men, female success rate, at the time when we started to look at this data, when I went to the ARC, was 5% lower than men at the early stage. And in fact, by the time, if you made it to the end, the success rates were similar. So that started me thinking around this part of the career, uh, as well as the pipeline, um, you know, and the, and the drop off, that, that we were really um, doing things at the very early stages that disadvantaged women. And it was things like, uh, grant applications where you, to get an early career grant, you had to be attached to a more senior researcher and that privileged men who'd come from, uh, you know, had, had the advantage of male patronage to the kind of criteria we were putting here around attendance at conferences and, 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 uh, and things like medals actually and prizes that disproportionately um, men were nominated, men, men were more highly represented at, even at the early stage of the career uh, at medals. So we set about trying to address that with a whole range of um, measures and including um, introduce changing the terminology from measuring track record, which is like a track you get on and never get off, to research opportunity and performance evidence and really training the committees and um, getting people to take into account career breaks in particular, but also other factors that may impact on careers. And, I think that's been one of my most important legacies from my time there. So that I did at the ARC and had a wonderful experience. And the advantage of doing things at the national level is that it now influences, uh, it influence practice within Australian universities. And, uh, uh, you know, I see it and hear about it in promotions and other assessments across the Australian university sector. So then the CEO of the ARC is not a job you can do forever. So I, uh, by that stage, um, by the end of my time there, my parents had both passed away. My daughter had finished high school, so we were a more mobile family. And so off we went to Melbourne, where I had an amazing time at the University of Melbourne as the provost. It was a great privilege. And then um, uh, went, came to ARC. And Throughout that time, I was fortunate. I had many, many good bosses. I mentioned Leon at the outset, um, but I also had um, terrific vice chancellors at Wollongong who gave me opportunities. My first boss in Canberra was uh, uh, the then education minister, Julie Bishop, who was, went on to be a very successful foreign minister, had a great support from various other ministers, chief scientists, and also uh, went to work with an extraordinary leader at, at uh, Melbourne. And, in all of those career decisions, I looked very much about who my boss was going to be and who and how was I going to be supported, uh, with the exception of going to the ARC because I didn't know politics is a bit less, but I'm more unpredictable. But uh, it was 
choosing to go to environments or opportunities where I was going to learn something about leadership or, or front was um, very important. And from my time at the ARC, but elsewhere, um, I've been very focused on images and language and how we can ensure that we're sending the right images. So in, that, in my time at Melbourne, um, in this middle photo where I, there's, I, I come up, up to my office every morning and be confronted with portraits of male vice chancellors staring at me. Um, and uh, I set about trying to do what we could to change various uh, change that at the University of Melbourne um, and was delighted when at a graduation ceremony later in my time at Melbourne that we actually had a, a, an all-female um, official party from the Dean of Science, Karen Day, who I uh, encouraged to uh, take up that appointment. Bridget Ogilvy, who's a great friend of Karen and I, um, our, we had a female chancellor, me as the female provost and the female um, president of the academic board. So that was a momentous time for graduations. I um, And I supported it not only that, but a range of other initiatives. So I was delighted at um, uh, when I came to QUT uh, to be able to bring a program which is based on Harvard Square to um, Washington uh, in the US and we were started in Melbourne by Carol Schwartz and others shown here, and we brought that to QUT. And we're working in, in providing opportunities for aspiring politicians, uh, female politicians, to train them to get more representation in Parliament, um, which is, again, uh, incredibly important. I was confronted with the same images here um, in my council room at QUT, and I've controversially taken them all out of the council room so we're not confronted at every meeting by at least we had one female staring at us, but not those kind of images. And I had a um, on the left here um, uh, in the bottom uh, is a, a meeting where uh, through I had um, female provost, female registrar, female PVC Indigenous, uh, female DVCR and, and all their support team, women, and an important meeting in my office. It's the first time I I think in my memory that I've had a meeting like that where everybody in the room was a woman. I was so much more used to being in a room with lots of men. Um, and very committed and um, to, uh, to equity here at QUT and also um, engagement with Indigenous colleagues. And we're starting to, see, and, you know, we're seeing that in everything that we do. And again, um, it's been a consistent theme throughout my career to support uh, women and increasingly focusing on diversity of um, backgrounds as well. So, you know, I'm, I'm conscious as a white middle class woman, I had advantages that many others didn't. So also turning my attention to that. So um, I've got a couple more minutes and then I'm gonna finish. So I was asked to talk about what's important for leadership. I've tried to demonstrate through, through a bit of my story through that, but I, when I'm giving um, uh, presentations on leadership, I think, the things that I've learned is it's really important for the leaders to paint the context. And, you know, I, that's one thing I've done consistently with my staff here at QUT through, I've tried to do through COVID is this is where we're at, this is what we know, this is what we don't know. And to give confidence to the team and to those that you're trying to support that they can also achieve the commitment. And so that in various ways, demonstrating that you, you know, if you take something on that you'll finish it and do that. Um, and uh, so I've always um, ensured that, you know, my team understands um, what my commit com committed to and, and working through that. Always looking to show compassion. So empathy, um, looking to bring on people who um, in, into conversations or into opportunities where they might not otherwise and ensuring that you take into account family circumstances and, and, uh, and other challenges. Communication you can never do enough of and collaboration has been, you know, key to everything that I've achieved and, and over my career, you can't do anything on your own. Um, and uh, so, uh, and I've also um, tended to focus all of those efforts and, and everything that I've tried to do on things that I'm passionate about where I can make a difference where maybe others wouldn't. And so, you know, whether it's committing to uh, continuing to promote gender equity or diversity and, and you know we're doing a lot of work um, here at QT in, in um, 
Indigenous for supporting Indigenous staff and students um, is um, it's important also if you're going to do a leadership role that you do it and you can make a difference. So, um, and is it worth it? Well, I, I one of my proudest moments was actually standing, um, being able to award my daughter her testament when she graduated from um, the University of Melbourne. So she's shown here being uh, getting ready for that and. Um, uh, you know, uh, I hopefully I've left a pretty good legacy there. She's teaching down in, in, in Victoria now, and um, so it's it's always a struggle balancing family and and uh, careers. But um, uh, you you should never um, uh, underestimate this this legacy as well as your own career legacies. And so I've been pretty supported by my husband and my daughter throughout my career as well. So that's, um, I'll stop sharing and then I'm happy to take any questions and hopes that was, uh, give, gave you a little tour of my uh, careers uh, and uh, um, some helpful uh, things along the way. Well, that was beautiful, Margaret. <laughs> Thank you, Margaret, that was, that was brilliant. Um, so yes, I put your emoji hands together, I guess, and thank you to Margaret for, uh, for that wonderful presentation. Um, Yes, we're happy to take questions, but I think I'm going to use my uh, post prerogative and jump in with one very early on. Um, and perhaps one of the, I think, you know, most pertinent question for the current times that we find ourselves in. So over the past 40 years, you know, you've seen great change, I think, not just in science, but in the university landscape here in Australia. But I think if I asked you, you would probably say the last two years are probably where you've seen the most change and most likely the most challenges. Would that be correct? Um, well, not necessarily. <laughs> I mean, this last couple of years have been incredibly challenging for all of us, you know, around the world. Um, but I think uh, in some ways it, the, the big change in, in Australian higher education for me was the growth so when I left Australia in 1988, I didn't think I'd come back, right? It, universities were miserable, they were underfunded, um, and, uh, you know, career prospects as a scientist were pretty bleak. And, and, and I really, I mean, in fact, my father bawled his eyes out at the airport. He didn't think we'd ever come home. And I came home because um, I wanted to come home, and it was hard, yeah, hard to bring it young academic in the US as well, um, as Gavin and, and you, you know, I don't need to tell you guys that. And, and then it just changed almost uh, overnight. So we went from um, having, uh, so, and it was um, introducing the income contingent load so universities could charge fees so that, you know, the universities grew. And then we started to accept international students and then that, and then the research funding picture changed. It's gone backwards in the last four or five years, um, but that was a very, very rapid change and expansion. It was, but it was different to now because it was a change that had opportunities because there were jobs. I spent my endlessly on selection committees, you know, and recruiting and so on at, at Wollongong. And, um, but it was a bit, so that was a big positive change, right? Um, but it, it had different challenges. But now this year, what, if, what it feels to me like is we've just kind of stopped and become isolated again and, and you know, and research funding is becoming harder and there are fewer job opportunities. So it's, it's and so if you only experience that those boom years, these last couple of years feel pretty grim. Um, if I do the 30 year thing or the 40 year thing, um, we're still in an incredible, um, system of, you know, international higher education with amazing researchers and opportunities, but it's just paused a bit at the moment, Sarah. <laughs> so I'm optimistic, actually. That's really great to hear. I think, you know, uh, for a lot of us, it does seem like pretty dire times. So getting that perspective, I think, is very important. Um, so we know that Australian universities in particular have taken a big hit in the last two years in terms of research funding. Actually, even over the last 10 years, that's been in steady decline. Um, but, you know, this, this year, for example, um, we've lost one in five jobs across the Australian university sector that came out this week. 
And so what I'm wondering is where, where do you see the opportunities are for us to recover from this? So people like us who are working in the system, um, where, do, where do you think that, that we're going? Um, I think, uh, so, so what's happened in Australian higher education, sorry, international colleagues, is while, we, while this growth of the, the government uh, allowed the international education and, to expand, and what we what Australian universities did was essentially take the premium from the international fees and invest it in research capability, uh, and and fill the deficit that the government then didn't have to 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 provide in terms of funding to the main funding agencies. And the rationale for that was that that universities did that investment because then it improved our international ranking if we had did better research and then we attracted more international students so we're in this circle and what the COVID and the international travel bans has broken that link and so what I think will happen Sarah is that we'll end up an Australian university is very large by world standards I mean my university is 50,000 students Melbourne 60 65 70 now maybe 60 um, they're huge, by, by UNSW is huge. Um, and we have to rethink about, first of all, our proposition for international students. I don't think it's sustainable to continue to ask them to fund the national research effort. And also um, uh, I, what, what research we should be doing and how we fund that. So, you know, I think there'll be a, a, some momentum coming out of this to, to say, uh, not maybe with the current government, but maybe with a future government, that, um, you know, everything you've relied on in this pandemic and our, our Doherty Institute, all our experts have been largely funded off the back of international student fees. Um, you need to invest in that going forward or we'll lose that capacity. And I think it's not quite the time for that, but I think the time will come to that that will be the case. It won't be as big though. I don't think we'll have as big a research workforce or as big a academic institutions going forward. I think we'll see some scaling back, which is great for your jobs unless you're in an area which is still going to be in demand. Sorry, which um, uh, I don't think there's an oversupply of. Um, scientists necessarily, but it might feel like that if you're applying for jobs, but there's still um, other areas where there's, where, and we're getting school shortages at, at the moment because we can't bring people in as well. Mm, absolutely, I know that there's a number of people feeling the pinch of not being able to get postdocs in from overseas. Mm. You know, um, funding time timelines haven't really changed, so their funding will expire before they can do that. And so, yeah, I think it is uh, yeah. difficult on all fronts. Perhaps some positive. Uh, Gavin, question? Yeah. Um, so, Margaret, I'm really pleased for you to, to hear you say that you don't believe we have an overabundance of scientists because I think that is becoming the sort of the perception. Um, it's clear that while we don't have an overabundance of scientists, we probably don't have enough science jobs for those scientists to go into. Um, but it's pretty clear that, you know, we can take our science skills that are very transferable into other areas. How do you think we're going to pivot to that? Well, I think, um, I, I, I mean, I, I think the, um, part, part, one of the things I get really excited in the Pathways to Politics program is if, if I get any scientists in there, I'd love to see more scientists in government and in politics. Um, and uh, I think, um, you know, actually, if you look at... Um, CEOs in Australia, the, the number that have science and engineering training is very high, actually, because we've had a disproportionate, you know, um, resource sector kind of uh, uh, top, you know, our top companies, there's many resource sector um, represented. So I, I think we've got to say to our, yeah, you know, when I think about all my science, I, I find my scientific training every day, even though I'm not working in in, in the lab, though I did, did uh, collaborate with the group up here and actually provide some input to a PhD student recently managed to um, 
get on a paper with them. But um, the um, uh, so I think we've got to, as we're training our young scientists, uh, encourage them to look more broadly that, you know, being an academic, I mean, it's a great career being a scientist, but there's also great careers using your scientific skills in yeah. leadership, in in uh, uh, in government, in, in in industry. So I think we've got to um, uh, we've got to encourage people to look more broadly as well. The more scientists we have out there, don't tell anybody I said this, the better, you know, in terms of um, uh, influence. I'm not sure about scientists in politics. I think we're probably a bit too honest uh, to be um, uh, to be good in that particular field. Yeah, be good. We had a few. <laughs> it would be good, yes. Thanks. Uh, uh, yep, so we have a question from Tusi. Thank you, Tusi. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Margaret, it's a great, great talk. Um, I have a question about, because you've shown a, such a smooth, um, you know, progress in your career. Did, did you have any obstacles in the way you go in and how do you cope uh, with the um politics and <laughs> look it looks smooth but you know there's failed grant applications there's failed job applications there's setbacks um, um uh, there's tough things i've had to do they still complain about things i did at melbourne and you know taking secretaries away from doctors and so on um look um it it's um you know i i, I think one of the things that, I mean, what I did, tried to do was make the best decision at the time, you know, so that's why I talked about the dean decision. It was really, I didn't set out to become the dean at all. I never even crossed my mind until the head of biology rang me up and said, I think you should be the dean, because he didn't want to do it. Um, and um, uh, and then I weighed up the, you know, the, the what, what that meant for the family. It, you know, I was being offered jobs in other places, including I went for a job, I applied for it kind of weirdly at UCLA. Um, and um, and because I thought it was one plane trip away, so it wouldn't be too bad. I'm glad I'm not there now. Um, but uh, I, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. I just knew that I'd kind of done enough of the same. You know, I wasn't going to, I wasn't that excited about lecturing second year analytical chemistry. Don't tell anyone that, Gavin. But, you know, I, I was sort of at the point where I wanted to do something different. And I just, at the time, that opportunity seemed like something that I could do good in. And, then, and, that, and that was the same with the ARC so, and Melbourne and here. Um, so, but, you know, it, the higher up you go, the harder that, that glass ceiling gets pretty, you know, it, it, it gets harder and harder. So, you know, I applied for a number of, a couple of VC jobs in different places where, um, you know, I might have been bitten by a man who I think was maybe not as competent as me, but, you know, um, uh, uh, but and then I look back and think some of them were a lucky escape. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm very happy I ended at QUT. And, um, and, you know, and then I thought very hard about, leaving Melbourne and whether I should apply for the job there. And in the end, I decided that the things that I wanted to do, you didn't get to do as the VC of a big institution like Melbourne. A big institution like Melbourne, you have to do a lot of donor smooching and stuff downtown. And I really like working with academics. Yeah. Thank you so, so much. I can do here as That's well as the donor bit, bit. I, don't have, I don't have to do as much. So it's <laughs> the right size for me. It's the right culture for me. And I think that's... Also, that applying for those other roles made me think about whether I, I, um, I would have been a good cultural fit. So by the time I had decided that I wanted to apply for QT, I knew it was a good fit for me and I had the experience. But, you know, um, it wasn't all smooth sailing. Yeah. Great and, advice. Thank you. And that's why I showed the photos where I was rather chubby. I didn't look after my <laughs> physical health as well as I should have. Sorry, I got Denise and um, Tara. Sorry, Sarah. Uh, yeah, so I'm just cognizant we're coming up on the hour. Are you happy to take a couple more questions? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, I am. Uh, so I think Denise had her hand up first. I just wanted to add to that and ask you how you would deal with rejection or what advice you could give for those who are starting out in our career. How, how, what's the best way do you think we should deal with rejection? 
Um, well, that's partly why I showed that grant application review. That was my very first project grant. Um, uh, I think you have to, um, I mean, you know, I applied for heaps of grants that I didn't get. I've applied for um, jobs that I didn't get. Um, and I think uh, you, you've got to kind of, I found each one of those, with one exception, where I thought I should really, really thought I should have got it. Um, uh, I, they weren't the right thing for me, so I, I think of them as lucky escapes. So I, I would. Um, I remember being in this. I was in not long after my mother died. We thought, oh well, we can go anywhere now. You know, mum and dad. Are, I mean, not not. I wasn't happy about my mother dying. It was very sad, but. It, that had been a constraint in terms of where I could live in, in New South Wales and, and Canberra. You know, I went for this job at a university which shall remain nameless and halfway through the interview I thought, God, I really don't want this job. And, um, and um, these people are not um, go ambitious, you know, this was, this was a VC's job. Anyway, I didn't get it and the woman who was the external vice chancellor on the committee came to see me later and said that it was actually going around the room as you do, and it was sort of heading my way. And then this older woman on the committee said, um, I don't think, I think she's too big for this job and she's not going to like it. And um, and the, older, the reason the woman told me the story was she was horrified that this other woman had said this and, turned, and then it turned back and they offered it to someone else. And I think, thank God that woman said that. I'd still be there <laughs> and I would have hated it and it was a really bad fit. And um, so I think, but, I, you know, I was a bit peeved at the time because I thought I was better than the person who got it. Um, so I think you've got to, you know, say, and it doesn't mean you want to beat your head against a brick wall and keep applying for things that you don't get, but some of it is about applying for stuff or going for things or trying things and then learning from it and going, oh, well, that didn't work. And what did I learn from that? You know, so, um, hopefully that's helpful. Thank you. I was also, I was more leaning towards grants, grants, rejections. Oh, grants. But that, oh, that's also. <laughs> well, grants, you just got to, grants and paper rejections, you just got to deal with and learn from it. Persevere. And, right. Persevere. <laughs> I said when, uh, early on in, when I was at DVC Art Wollongong, I used to just show a table of how many grants I'd applied for and how many I got. And, you know, I wasn't batting above <laughs> the national success rate. I was just about average. Um, so you've got to apply, yeah. yeah. And take feedback Thank and you. get advice, yeah. Yeah, I think that's um, really great advice. And one of the pieces of advice my boss has given me in the past is to let yourself just be grumpy about it for a day and then... Uh, get on with it the next day. So that's how I tend to approach it these days. Um, no, no, I was going to say, what you don't do is write a letter <laughs> to ARC because then we used to compare them uh, amongst the executive directors to who got the rudest complaint. Um, something funny <laughs> to get one. And my boss, Kim Carr, who was the minister for a while, after our first grant announcement, he said, I thought everyone would be happy when I gave out money. And I said, no, minister. Four out of the five people uh, that applied didn't get a grant, so they're all unhappy. <laughs> so, so, yeah, you just got to keep going. Uh, yeah, we'll have one final question from Tara. Hi, Margaret. Thanks for your talk. Um, I actually just had a question again related to grants. So, obviously, with, you know, resources being scarce and all of these kinds of things, there's talk about you know, changing the way we do science and and you know, the way we teach, but there's not a lot of change to the way we apply for grants. It's a very traditional process and you kind of highlighted some of the flaws about who gets funded and things like that. Do you have any suggestions like what we could do as a community to kind of inform best practices or what might better support grant allocations of funds going to the right places? So, I mean, the problem in Australia is this, is that there's you know, if I look at the ARC profile, and even and it's worse now because the proportion is lower, is um, it's a very flat curve between what gets funded and what. So you know, the the curve is on on all all ratings. You know, there's there's some that stand out, 
and then there's a big flat curve of grants which are, are good and fundable and then it drops off a bit at the end. And so the randomness comes because you're basically making decisions along a flat curve. And so that's what I used to say to people when, the, when we were doing the last 5%. I said, we're actually deciding between all of this is fundable, let's, let's add some other priorities to it. So, um, so the best solution is for the entire sector, and that includes CSIRO and business and everybody to lobby for a, a new funding model that has more, more money in it so that we get down below the curve. That's one thing. The second thing is Australia's funding agencies are, are funded at an extraordinarily low rate relative to the amount of money they give out. So it was 1.8% when I left. It's probably down to about 1.1. Um, the last time I looked at the British ones, they were at 4 or 5% and the US was 8 or something. And so the investment in that and that upfront assessment versus investing in the regulator, Peter Hoy describes it as investing in the um, undertaker rather than the neonatal unit uh, or the birthing unit. We need more investment in the the mechanics of it so that we're not, so that they have the right kind of, uh, you know, what's gone out of the ARC is the capacity to fund academics to work in it. Because if, if there'd been a physics academic working in the ARC, they would not have made that decision about preference. You know, um, it's that's what's missing um, because a physics academic would have said, that's a ridiculous decision. Physics has all these preprints, you know, but that, that and I had those people there when I was there, as did Aidan. So it's the investment both in the, the quantum, but also that, you know, the, the kind of, you can't administer research grants as a bureaucratic process. You've got to have academic input and, that, and that's the challenge. So that's where we've got to lobby. Thanks. And the, Public the way the public service is structured, it's very hard to get academics to work at the ARC. Well, again, I just want to thank you so much for yeah. being here with us today, Margaret. Thank you for your talk and for answering our questions. Um, before I hand back to Erin uh, to finish up the meeting, um, I know she normally calls for announcements, so I'm going to jump in again, <laughs> jump the gun on that. I've just got a couple of quick ones. So many of you, uh, I think all of the Australians on this call currently would already know that the Anzimus conference has been moved online this year due to the current um, COVID status in many states, including the state in which it was supposed to be held. And so I just wanted to extend a special invite to any Australian expats that might be on the call or watching this video at a later time to submit an abstract and, and come and connect with the Australian research, uh, mass spectrometry research community. Uh, abstracts are due in uh, 9 a.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time on the 27th of September. The second announcement is um, for FEMS Awards. Um, so as I mentioned at the start, uh, Tusi and I are both the co-chair of the FEMS Awards Committee. And in the coming, coming week, we hope to announce um, the details of a new um, awards that we have, uh, FEMS Empowerment Awards. And so this is an award scheme that we hope to offer quarterly. Um, <clears throat> so four times a year, uh, where members can apply for up to 300 uh, US dollars for basically anything that's career related. Conference registration, course registration, even childcare fees if you wanna to go to a conference and need to arrange childcare, um, that sort of stuff. Um, so we'll be hopefully putting out the details of that next week and the actual awards um, application will start from the 1st of October. We hope to announce them before the end of the month. So please stay tuned to the uh, FEM socials and so forth for that one. And with that, I'll hand back to Erin. Thanks so much, Sarah. And let's give Sarah and Margaret a huge hand. I know Sarah has been organizing this since April because she really wanted Margaret to be able to be showcased by our FEM. So we really appreciate both of you, like Margaret accepting and Sarah taking the huge amount of time to get everything so that we could get Margaret to come here. That's I, I really enjoyed the night and I think everybody else did too. And I know those that weren't able to join will love to watch the video for this. So amazing job to you both. Um, I don't have very many announcements. So if other people have announcements, um, 
Currently, I am planning to attend ASMS, and so if anybody else on here is, we're planning to have a FEMS meeting, just a, like a, a tea time where anybody that actually can come, I know that the Australians can't come, of, unfortunately, but if there's anybody on here that's planning to come to ASMS, please touch bases with me, because we're hoping to plan just a little you know, a nice area to meet. And then maybe we'll be outside. We'll, we'll try and find an area where people feel they're safe to, to meet. But I know a lot of you guys won't be able to make it to ASMS, but that's, uh, um, that's my main one. Are there any other ones that we're missing out? Oh, and Kaylee said, yeah, definitely check out the inaugural FEMS newsletter for general FEMS news and updates. So I think it's posted on the website, isn't it, Kaylee? But it was a really nice one where we were kind of highlighting all of the, the news. Yep, it is on the website. So, and it'll be um, every other month. So I think their next one will be in November to come out. And then we'll also be having a Christmas, a virtual Christmas party. So we'll get a date out for everybody to stick that on your calendar and we'll try and do something really fun. So people can join and maybe we'll have some fun um, mass specy games or something goofy to bring everybody around and try and find a a time that will work for everybody, which is always hard. I think it's 10 a.m. Eastern is the best for most people for that, because then I think we hit you guys about 10 p.m. And then, and then uh, Europe, we hit about 6 p.m. So, but, uh, but yeah, I really, I really enjoyed this. Oh, Sarah, what else do you have? Yeah, sorry, I just popped it in the chat, but I've seen it, um, the mentorship program applications. Oh. I believe they close the 30th of September. Is that right? I think that's right. Yeah. So please, if you want to be a mentor or a mentee, make sure to sign up for that mentorship program. And I really enjoyed my little mentorship pod last year. I was one of four mentors and then we had, I think, 12 mentees and we really had a good time throughout the year. But it was a great experience. But yeah, and so as normal FEMS fashion, we'll end on a networking event in case, and if, if you guys have to pop off, don't worry about that, but uh, I'll make little breakout groups. And I think um, uh, some of Margaret's talk would be great to discuss during that if you're able to stay on, but I loved at the end her six C's where she talked about, I've got to pop them up again, but I thought that was so clever, Margaret, where you talked about um, the key elements of leadership were context, confidence, commitment, compassion, communication, and collaboration. And uh, I think one thing that's really hard for women in science is confidence. And so I thought that in the breakout room, you guys could talk about ways that you're trying to overcome maybe problems with confidence and exerting confidence in what you're doing. So um, I think that would be great advice to others that might have trouble in that area. So I will break you out. If you have to go, no, no problem though, but if you can stay on for the, the little pods, please stay on. And I'm gonna stop the recording now so you guys can stay safe.